Hello, friends and members of the Baton Rouge chapter of the Louisiana Archaeological Society. Today we have Dr. Heather McKillop with us. She is a professor in the Department of Geography and Anthropology at LSU. Um, Dr. McKillop, if you can just uh, give us a little background on um, what it is that you study and what you do. Okay, well, I've, um, I've had the, uh, the great opportunity to be able to uh, work in Belize on the ancient Maya since I was a graduate student at Trent University in Canada. And uh, I excavated at an, a Maya island site. And then for my dissertation, I um, went to UC Santa Barbara, which was my dream. And uh, it's a great school. It's also on the beach in Southern California. And uh, excavated another island site, Wild King Key. And after that, I, uh, I wondered what was in the area. So I was uh, in Belize and I applied for a job at LSU. And uh, when I came back to Canada, I, uh, there was a message on my answer machine, actually more than one. And uh, so I came down to LSU and they took me canoeing in Alligator Bayou. Uh, it was and it was warm. There were seats <clears throat> to, uh, to go to Belize and to take students and to work in the archaeology lab and I've got now a 3D lab and uh, we're hoping uh, to go back to Belize in uh, in a few weeks. Uh, it's the first time since Mar since uh, 2019. Who would have thought uh, that would have been uh, our last field season? So I'm pretty excited right now and uh, I also uh, appreciate, really appreciate the opportunity. It's been a while since I've given a talk to the Baton Rouge chapter of the LAS, or uh, I've also given a talk at the annual LAS meetings. And uh, as chair of the Antiquities Commission, I, I hear about what's going on. I have a great interest, but I, I don't have any conflicts of interest. So I, I hope I could be uh, a, uh, a good uh, overviewer of uh, things that come across the Antiquities Commission. Anyway, I'm really excited to be here with uh, two of our uh, LSU graduate students, Brandy and Margo. Well, we're very excited to have you. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to you and let you go ahead and do your presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about our uh, planned research this spring in Belize. With the title of my talk is Back to the Lagoon, Equinal Belize in 2022. Here you see the location of Ekwe Nal, which is in a shallow saltwater lagoon system in southern Belize. Here's a map. The insert is a map of southern Belize. And uh, this is a virtually unpopulated area. It's the nearest town is Punta Gorda, 30 miles away. And we stay with the host family in the jungle, the rainforest, uh, halfway in between. And we go out every day for field work or for lagoon work in the lagoon. So this is uh, a research that I'm planning with Dr. Corey Sills, who's a former LSU geography PhD graduate, some of you know, uh, worked at the Division of Archaeology and uh, now has a job at, as an associate professor at University of Texas at Tyler. So we've been planning to go back here uh, with NSF funding since 2020 when COVID hit. So hopefully things will go well and we'll leave in a few weeks with um, a group of students to excavate this underwater site. Uh, if you um, want to learn more about the site, we published an article which is open access, which means that you can read it freely you can click on uh, my name or Bricotage and Brine or Ancient Mesoamerica and uh, read all the details. Uh, I'm interested in, and I've been interested for a long time in how did the classic Maya get salt? We know where they got it from, but I want to know, you know, what were the mechanisms? What was the process? What, what was the trade like? How was it produced and things like that? Um, and first of all, you know that in Louisiana, Everybody knows that salt is important. Uh, it's the main ingredient in Tony Satry's and much of Louisiana cooking. It's a basic dietary necessity. It's a biological necessity, as well as um, 
improving the, the flavor of almost anything. Uh, the classic Maya civilization in the southern Maya lowlands of Guatemala and Belize and parts of the Yucatan of Mexico had wonderful cities in the jungle, but they didn't have enough salt. And so they had to trade for it or go and get it. Um, there are sources of solar evaporation salt on the north coast of the Yucatan, but closer to the core area of the Maya civilization during the classic period, which would be AD 300 to 900, were salt sources along the coast of Belize. And these have been submerged by sea level, sea level rise. So most of them are underwater. And that's what we're gonna be dealing with in Southern Belize at the Paynes Creek Salt Works. There are also some uh, brine boiling locations in the highlands of Guatemala and Chiapas, Mexico, where they did the same process of boiling brine in pots over fires to make salt, either loose salt or hardening it further to make salt cakes, which might be easier to trade, uh, throw a bunch of salt cakes in a canoe and paddle up the rivers and go to the marketplaces. There's also salt making sites on the Pacific coast of Chiapas, Guatemala, and El Salvador as well. So I'm gonna talk now about the Paynes Creek Salt Works. Uh, I <clears throat> wrote a book, Salt, White Gold of the Ancient Maya, a number of years ago, based on the excavation of three underwater sites and one site in a coastal lagoon. And this was the technique that was, uh, there's an artist depiction, Serge, in uh, a French journal, Science et Avenir. And I talked to him about how they were making them. So the, the brine was boiled in pots, held up by pot legs over fires. And maybe not these National Geographic outfits. I just said, have a look at National Geographic for the, out, for the outfit. So maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I think this really shows the, the brine broiling process really well. The thing that I, I knew that three, four sites really wasn't enough to supply enough salt for many of the inland Maya cities, the people at those urban centers. And so in 2004, I had a sabbatical and I got a faculty research grant the first year that LSU had them, an incentive grant. And I took a couple of graduate students and my boat driver, uh, Jackie, more than a boat driver, obviously, a, a local Belizean, look at the size of that pot shirt. The sea level had risen and we're walking over sites, looking for sites, doing basic pedestrian survey. Oh, this person's gotten a little out of alignment, uh, but uh, looking and feeling for things on the seafloor. And these sites have been hidden since the classic period and no one's trampled on them. So the uh, artifacts are really big and also um, they come washed, which is really convenient. In addition, we did find sites, but what we found was really surprising and unexpected. We found wooden posts with sharpened ends. So look at the sharpened end here. And you can see this is what, on a good day, what we might see on the seafloor. Uh, these were posts that were uh, from pole and thatch buildings, and they had preserved below the seafloor in mangrove peat, very organic peat, which had preserved uh, botanical remains and thousands, as it turned out, of these posts. But as soon as they came out of the seafloor into the sea, they were all decayed. And the pole and thatch buildings that they represented were like the pole and thatch buildings that the traditional Maya have in their villages today. And this is really stunning because they haven't preserved at other sites. When you go to Maya land, you see uh, stone temples and stone palaces. You might find the mounded remains of buildings where <coughs> there's low stone foundations and lots of artifacts, but you don't find the pole and thatch building. So this was a low-lying area that had been uh, subject to sea level rise and where the posts had been driven into the ground, they were preserved because the ground was, um, was peat and the peat had been developing since the end of the last ice age. And so there's 
a huge buildup of peat in southern Belize. And in particular, at least uh, four and a half meters we've tested uh, in this coastal lagoon of mangrove peat. So uh, we were pretty excited. And this really changed the process. Uh, in this slide, then you see, I had to think of new ways to look for sites. Instead of walking over them and stirring up the silt and damaging the, the sites potentially, I decided we should use um, research flotation devices and float over them and here you see the team floating in a line, just like pedestrian survey, only on floats and flagging posts where we found them. And here's a sea of flags representing posts and in some cases artifacts as well. So the goal of the new project was to find underwater sites with wooden structures, to map them with a total station and to radiocarbon date the sites. And we found, uh, and mapped, actually mapped 4,042 posts at 70 sites. We have um, a total of 110 sites, and we know that there are wooden posts at an additional 30 sites, so at a total of 100 sites. But those 30 sites are uh, in either in water that's too deep for total station mapping or uh, in two remote locations. So uh, I think we've got enough to see a good pattern here, at least to begin with. And I published this information in uh, my book, Maya Salt Works in 2019, University Press of Florida. And here you see a hardwood post and here you see a palmetto post. And there's me with a, the basic cutting tool, an 18 inch stainless steel knife, which we use to cut the peat when we're excavating and cut the tops off posts to take samples back. Uh, and if you've been to the archaeology lab at LSU, you'll see that it looks a bit like a Tupperware party with thousands of pieces of waterlogged wood in uh, plastic containers with water. And we keep them wet to preserve the integrity of the wood structure so that we can identify the species. And we have continued to use the wood, uh, even though some of it was excavated over or recovered over a decade ago for uh, radiocarbon dating and we changed the water. It's all desalinated now. And so this is a section of uh, the West Lagoon that gives you an idea of the GIS map, because we can't really see what the patterns are until we've uh, transferred the data from the, the uh, total station to, uh, to a GIS. And here you see two kinds of posts. The gray X's are lines of palmetto posts, which demarcate the edge of sites as, as far as the artifact distribution is, and may have shored up the walls of uh, the edges of sites where these sites were located just in the really low-lying ground by the lagoon to get access to the, the salty water. And then you see the other type of posts are hardwood posts, and here's a good example where you have a rectilinear building and then another rectilinear building. Some of them have interior room divisions and uh, some of them like this site may have been re rebuilt several times so that the post pattern is kind of messy. Uh, some of them uh, peat has, or mangrove has accreted or grown over the sites. And so we don't have the complete post pattern. This is only what we found and mapped from uh, survey not from excavation. Here's Equinal, which is uh, underwater in depths from about six inches by the mangrove shoreline to six feet or more. And our flotation survey hasn't been able to go deep enough, uh, but we have tried in the deep water using uh, the airline system of hoses from a gas powered generator. Some of you may have uh, used Snuba or be familiar with this technique, which has been used a lot in historical archeology, span uh, such as in um, Jamaica by Texas A&M excavating the port city there. Uh, so we've tried this in the deep water and it's uh, really low tech and really easy to use. It allows us to stay underwater for long periods of time and excavate as opposed to diving down, coming up, diving down, coming up. So it's, it's a great technique. Uh, and so we'll use that to excavate this deeper site. Here you see the team 
following a line of palmetto posts, these red flags, and feeling with your hands. It's like looking for something that feels like a, a fingernail. And it's you have to really focus and concentrate on what you're finding uh, and what you're looking for. Because you can easily just feel around something and create a post out of peat, but there's a difference. So there is some skill. Uh, we have a 4,000 year record that we've documented by excavating a column sample um, in an off site location and then radiocarbon dating the fine mangrove and I have a, a doctoral student Cher Foster who's going to be doing some more of that at Equinol for her as part of her dissertation and here you see Dr. Sills and a former another former student Dr. Mark Robinson both former geography PhD students at LSU um, holding up artifacts which we've flagged and individually mapped. And here is on a good day what you might see on the seafloor in terms of artifacts. And then here's give you an idea of using a total station in a in the water. We don't actually put the total station in the water. We put the total station on firm ground. It won't. You can't set it up in the water. I've tried that. You get an error message. It has to be firm ground. It's hard to find. We make permanent data markers out of poured concrete. And then to take the prism pole, here's Bretton Summers, here's Dr. Bretton Summers, another LSU PhD grad, holding the prism pole. And Jackie is uh, locating the posts and holding them on the, uh, you put this on the top of the, the, the uh, post on the sea floor. And you see these uh, fish floats we use when the water is deeper to fish floats to fishing line and a little piece of metal skewered in the sea floor to mark the locations. So we're always devising new systems. Uh, here's a map of uh, 10 buildings, 10 wooden buildings or pole and thatch buildings at the Equinol site, which we hope to excavate. And um, there's a spit of land going through here. That's where Cher is going to do uh, some excavations looking for sea level rise uh, before the sites were occupied and, and then after when they were flooded by continual sea level rise. Another doctoral student, Holly Lincoln, is going to look at here where we found a lot of uh, stone tools, which I'll mention in a minute. This is from our book, our uh, article in Ancient Mesoamerica. So we actually haven't found salt. The, we find salt everywhere. It's salt water, but we haven't found the product salt. And so we base this on an analogy to modern and historic and archaeological examples from around the world where this technique was used of boiling brine in pots over fires and the same bricotage was found uh, around the world. So here's the traditional pole and thatch buildings. Uh, these are photos that were taken by Robert C. West, a former geography faculty member in, in LSU Geography and Anthropology and now in the Cartographic Information Center. And I use the model of Sacapulas, which is in the highlands of Guatemala, where people live in houses uh, near a, salt, a highland salt spring, and they have uh, salt kitchens all along uh, the edge of where this salt spring is. And they, here you see uh, an article from uh, Robert Reina and John Meinigan in X. Expedition magazine. They have great uh, photos and describe this process where they're, they've got a couple of dozen bulls being held over a fire and they're, they're pouring the brine in uh, and they toss out the bricotage afterwards. And this is what we find at the Paints Creek Salt Works. There's a tray of bricotage from one of our excavations. And so again, at Sacapulas, Here's somebody carrying salty soil from the soil around the salt spring, and he's take, putting it in this wooden box. And then uh, there's a hole underneath with a, a screen to prevent silt from going through. And he's collecting the enriched brine underneath. So he takes some salty, salty water and pour it through. So you're basically taking the salty water and taking the salt out of it and enriching the brine so that you don't have to use as much fuel. And then they carry it in pots 
to the salt kitchen, a dedicated building where they only make salt. It's like if you've ever made maple syrup from sap, you, you have a dedicated place to make it. And that's the only thing that you do in the sugar shack or in the salt kitchen. Um, and here's uh, a map showing of Equinal with the pink areas showing where we've got Bricketage mapped and the uh, brown and black, the posts. And here's an example of uh, jars and bowls. This is, I don't have to explain these to you as archeologists that, um, but they're rough on the outside and smooth on the inside. And they were standardized in their dimensions. Like they were making something of standard sizes. And I think they were making salt cakes. And here's a pot leg, solid clay cylinder and globs of clay were put at the top and bottom of these cylinders, one to support the pot um, above the fire and one to uh, at, the, at the base of it. And then we have water storage jars. Some map shows where we have piece plotted, individually mapped uh, storage jars. And these have decoration, stamp decoration, very similar to pots from a number of inland cities, which may have been the recipients of the salt. We think that these were made inland and traded to the salt works. So this could be a, uh, an example of how, um, how we can identify the consumers of salt. And you also, on a return trip to uh, delivering salt, if you're going by boat, if you know anything about boats, that uh, it's good to have a ballast in the boat, to have a, have a weight in the boat to keep it uh, going straight in the water. One, another surprising thing that we found was um, the stone tools. The stone tools, uh, I sent a bunch of them to a colleague, Kazuo Ioama, who is the expert on uh, ancient Maya, useware study of the edges of stone tools, chert and obsidian. And uh, increasingly, he's been looking at other materials as well. He did experimental studies at Copan and elsewhere. And he's worked at Seval and other sites. And he collaborated with me. He did the useware study. I said, you know, we've got, we've mapped 4,042 posts. We've only excavated a few of them because it's a conservation issue. If we excavate them, but they all had sharpened ends. They had to cut these trees down. They must have been used for woodworking. He found that almost all of them were used for processing fish or meat, and very few of them were used for uh, cutting wood or, or scraping wood or whittling wood. And another interesting thing, well, we don't have fish. What happened to the fish? The peat is highly organic and preserves botanical material, but it eats away at calcium carbonate. So anything with calcium carbonate is destroyed. Like uh, there's no, no carbon left for uh, in shell. We've got some shells at some sites, but there's nothing, oxygen isotope analysis comes back, not, no material present. And even the pottery that has uh, calcite temper in it uh, has been dissolved by the acidic mangrove peat. So wonderful it is for uh, preserving wood, it's terrible for preserving bone. So we think they just didn't preserve, but clearly there's lots of evidence for um, the edges. And the other interesting thing about the useware that Kazuo Ayama did is that the shape of the artifacts is not, not an indicator, at least here, of the use of the artifacts. So these stemmed points, unifacial stem points, the pointy end was not used. In fact, none of the pointy ends of the artifacts were used. The edges were used for scraping and cutting. And then most of these artifacts had each had multiple areas of use and multiple different areas of use, some for whittling wood, some for cutting wood, cutting or scraping uh, fish or, or other um, animal material. So multi-use 
and the morphology or the shape doesn't really indicate uh, what it was used for. And this is, um, here's some that were used for whittling or cutting wood. And these were used for whittling and cutting wood and for cutting fish uh, or meat. So multi-purpose. And we published this in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And this article, you can also click on, or you can just do a search and find it. It's open access. You can see the pictures and read the details. And then my, uh, my 12 minutes of fame, I got interviewed by Ira Flato. If you've ever heard Science Friday, he is such a wonderful interviewer and so uh, knowledgeable. Uh, October 12th, 2018. Last time I looked recently, it's still, the link is still there. They have the Science Friday on NPR. Um, but this article, if you want to know uh, the details, is open access, uh, so freely available. We also found uh, a stone tool made of 98% pure jadeite. I received permission from the Institute of Archaeology, Government of Belize, to export this beautiful jadeite gouge that we found with a rosewood handle so that I could take it for expert study, not available in Belize. I was not allowed to uh, put it in the mail, even FedEx or UPS. I had to hand carry it. And so I made contact with the world's expert in jadeite, George Harlow at the American Museum of Natural History. And um, he agreed to meet me. And on, a, I think it was a Thanksgiving week when our daughter had a week off school, we went to New York and suddenly she said, as we were in the American Museum of Natural History, what are we doing here? I thought this was a vacation. Well, of course, archeologists, we can turn anything into a busman's holiday. But George Harlow got really excited and he actually took off a little piece of it, uh, not the display side, and um, analyzed it geochemically and found it to be 98% pure jadeite. So not only is this the only jadeite tool with, with a wooden handle, but it's a beautiful greenish translucent jadeite material from uh, not that far away from Guatemala, but what would such a beautiful jadeite be doing at a, uh, a salt work? It was just found, my boat driver found it right beside a wooden post. We were cutting post samples and he came up with the gouge. And I said, Jackie, feel around a bit more, see what else you can find. And he came up with this beautiful wooden handle and they fit together perfectly. Well, the jadeite, according to George Harlow, uh, the color is due to the tightly woven minerals, the grains, which make it a very durable material. So the fact that it's also pretty is incidental to the fact that it's a very strong material. Um, and so that's, that's what it was doing. These people at the Saltworks had the ability to import material that was uh, useful for their needs. And the chert is from Northern Belize, most of it. So they also got that from far away. We also found some other um, greenstone salts, jadeite and omphacite, and um, we have some of them mapped here. So it wasn't really a, a remote poor village at all. Uh, one of the things we did for the article in ancient Mesoamerica was to look at um, you know, what was going on here and how do we identify this as a, a salt making community, sort of like Sacopolis? So we had archeological correlates of activities in different spaces. So for a household, a salt kitchen, an area of fish processing, and an area of brine enrichment. So in a household, we would expect a diversity of pottery, a diversity of stone tools or wood items, food remains, ritual items that could be in the house or around the house. For a salt kitchen, we'd expect bricotage. Corn grinding is possible as well as in the house because they used corn meal uh, to uh, drop a bit in the brine to see if it was salty enough, it would float. 
And they also poured cornmeal around the uh, interior of the pots before they boiled it to make them nice and smooth. We wouldn't expect much food and we would expect the uh, salt making activities, the bricotage to be inside and right outside the uh, salt kitchen where they might toss the material as they did the finished material as they did at Sacopolis. Fish processing, maybe no pottery, could have stone tools, uh, fish or animal remains, uh, some kind of a fish rack or a storage box for salting fish and probably outside. Brine enrichment, we would expect storage jars, a container for salty soil. We found a canoe at one of our sites with a pot, uh, a funnel underneath. And so uh, it was an old canoe, I mean, really old and probably no longer in use. And then it would probably be outside. So uh, we used these correlates to try to figure out what was going on. And we think we have two areas that may have been houses and areas that were pure salt kitchens and a couple of places where they were maybe salting fish, processing fish, maybe salting it. So we've obviously got it. That's all from the seafloor mapping and survey. So we're going to test these out by excavating. Then in a, in a broader scale, I'm bringing it back out to what does this mean for the classic Maya? And so in my Maya Saltworks book, I talked about, um, I really think they had regional trade of salt. So the North Coast salt went to the Northern Yucatan, the salt from the coast of Belize, with the example from Payne's Creek, went to nearby inland cities, and the salt from the interior uh, salt works around brine springs like Salinas de los Nueve Cerros and Sacapulas and others was used nearby as well. And I used, I came up with estimates of salt production based on production at Sacapulas and found that there was lots of salt that was, could be produced um, using household production. So not organized or controlled by uh, inland people or local overseers, but produced by household, uh, surplus household production and transport uh, to mar inland marketplaces. And the model is uh, Sacapulas with, you see these salt cakes that they, they have and they take them to market in, in the region. And I, wrote an article, um, Salt Cakes in the Classic Maya Marketplace Economy. This is in Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. It's not open access. Uh, well, actually, it's called Salt as a Commodity or Money in the Classic Maya Economy. I used uh, Sacapulis as, as an example of, of this. And uh, if you want a copy of it, just send me an email and I'll try to uh, accommodate uh, requests unless I'm in Belize. So. I, we don't have email in the jungle. So what's new at Equinal? Uh, we've got our article. We hope to be excavating April to June of 2022 inside the building using dive equipment. That's Dr. Elizabeth Sills, a team of LSU students, Dr. Rachel Watson, who you know from the Division of Archaeology, and Jackie Young. We're, uh, we'll post updates on Facebook and on our underwatermaya.com website when we come to town. Um, so um, you can tune in to that. I'm very grateful for having received permits from the Belize Institute of Archaeology, uh, grants from the National Science Foundation, including uh, the current grant uh, to LSU and UT Tyler, to the Cartographic Information Center at LSU who has supported our research financially and um, also uh, from whom we've gotten photographs. Uh, student funding from the Robert C. West Fund from Geography and Anthropology, uh, our host family and lots of friends in Belize and current and former LSU students in the field and in the lab, more than who you saw pictured here. Uh, so thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. This is all very exciting, especially um... You know, being able to get back out there again. Uh, so y'all are going to be going to back to the same location? 
Uh, yeah, we hope to. But of course, uh, sometimes things have to change because of, I mean, we hope to go back to Equi and all. And then the third year is a different area of the lagoon. But sometimes we've had to um, change plans once we get to the lagoon because of the local conditions. Either the water's too hot in one area or um, there's there's other issues that um, so we have to be we have to make firm plans, but also have enough flexibility that we can be mobile. Sure, sure. And that happens quite a lot. Mm, right. Yeah. Well, that is yeah. uh, that's all very exciting, and we're certainly looking forward to some updates once y'all uh, have gotten back. Yeah. Well, we'll um, I'll post some things. I think I'm finally going to stop my uh, back porch daily updates and once we go to Belize because we won't have access to the internet in the jungle but every couple of weeks when we go into town we'll probably post on our um, under, underwater Maya research group Facebook page what we've been finding and when Great. we get back we'll we'll post on underwatermaya.com so thanks very much Brandy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for um, for agreeing to interview today. This is all very exciting. I know our members are really going to like it. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, thanks everyone for tuning in, and uh, we hope that you have a great month. And we'll be back next month with um, uh, another speaker, probably in person this time. But we'll absolutely keep everybody posted. So, thank you again, Dr. McKill. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for the opportunity to talk.